A uh, very good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the IISS. My name is Bastian Gigerich. I'm the director for defense and military analysis uh, here at the Institute. Uh, it's very nice to see uh, lots of old and good friends here in the room, but also some new faces, um, particularly for those who join us here for the first time. A, a very warm welcome. Uh, the IISS is a security and defense uh, uh, think tank. We look at uh, political, economic, uh, and other factors of, of conflict. And uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that you uh, joined us here tonight for uh, a discussion meeting on the subject of sea change, new maritime horizons in a changing world uh, with our uh, senior fellow for Naval Forces and Maritime Security, uh, Nick Childs. Of course, the maritime domain is a resource. It's a, it's a it's an area of uh, vital and important economic activity, a lifeline for our economies. It's also an arena uh, of uh, tension, uh, conflict, but also, of course, collaboration and cooperation. Um, and major powers around the world are, uh, in, the, are in the middle of uh, thinking through their roles uh, in, uh, in relation to maritime strategy, maritime security questions. Uh, some of you will have seen uh, the United States uh, uh, maritime strategy uh, document, which uh, puts out quite a challenging agenda. Others might have uh, had a glimpse of uh, the uh, Chinese um, uh, latest defense uh, uh, white paper, uh, which also defines uh, an ambitious uh, maritime agenda for, for uh, China. Many observers have dubbed uh, uh, this century the maritime century. There's a debate uh, about a possible revolution maritime affairs driven by geopolitical factors, but also by technology and, and technological change. Uh, and we want to talk tonight about uh, the potential implications uh, of these changes, of that shift um, uh, of new maritime horizons in a changing, uh, in a changing world. And uh, to do that, we have here with us uh, Nick Childs, uh, who will analyze some of the key strategic, economic, and technological indicators that are on the horizon in the naval and, and maritime sphere. Uh, and he will talk about how they could affect all of those uh, with a stake in maritime uh, uh, security. Uh, Nick Childs uh, joined us here at the Institute uh, in June of this year. Uh, many of you will know that uh, Nick has uh, spent a very distinguished career uh, as a BBC journalist uh, specializing in defense, security, and international affairs. Uh, among other things, he was the, first, uh, the BBC's first Pentagon correspondent, um, or world affairs correspondent, um, uh, defense and security correspondent, so a uh, very, very distinguished uh, and, and uh, extensive uh, career in this field. He reported on crisis and conflict around the world, really. Um, and has written uh, two books on the uh, modern Royal Navy, uh, including one entitled uh, Britain's Future Navy, and uh, various articles for think tanks, journals, and magazines. Um, and it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Nick uh, uh, to you. He will speak um, for about, I don't know, like 25 to 30 minutes. Um, he will speak from the lectern, actually, because he has some slides that he wants to share with us. And then uh, after that uh, part of the presentation, uh, uh, Nick and I will reconvene here um, for the discussion part uh, of, of today's meeting, where, of course, we are very much both are looking forward to getting as many uh, uh, of your views in uh, as well. And we'll uh, probably, uh, I will aim to bring this uh, to a conclusion around 7.45-ish, uh, um, uh, uh, so that there's a bit of time for informal conversation. Uh, following that part. But uh, with that introduction, Nick, over to you, and we're all very much looking forward to hearing from you uh, on this important subject. Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Bastian, and thanks to all of you uh, for coming here this evening. That's the first point. Secondly, I, I must underline that the motivation for giving this talk uh, now is not a personal conceit that uh, having recently arrived at the Institute as the uh, Senior Fellow for Naval Forces and Maritime Security, that uh, I, I feel that it's important that people hear from me early on. At least that's not 
entirely the reason. Um, it is really because the global strategic context in which matters maritime need to be considered has and is changing dramatically. So this event is something of a notice of intent as far as the Institute's ambition to take an active part in the debate over the course and implications of all of that, and also an appeal for help to as many of you who are interested and who have a stake in the unfolding developments uh, in and around the maritime domain to participate with us in that. Just a few years ago, the focus of the United States, the United Kingdom, and much of the West was on the grim and grinding land-centric campaigns of Iraq and Afghanistan, non-state actors, counter-terrorism, and counter-insurgency. Journals like the U.S. Naval Institute's Proceedings played host to articles that spoke of the post-naval era, citing the lack of a major naval engagement involving the world's preeminent naval power in some seven decades. Even in the depths of the West's Iraq-Afghanistan preoccupation, this may at most have been only a partial worldview. In 2007, Professor Paul Kennedy wrote of what he described as a remarkable global disjuncture it involved, as he put it, massive differences in the assumptions of European nations and Asian nations about the significance of sea power today and into the future. While manifestly neither Iraq nor Afghanistan has gone away as a security issue, we are in a post or even a post-post Iraq and Afghanistan period, conditioned particularly by the toxicity of those engagements in the United States and the United Kingdom. We are in an era of renewed strategic and geopolitical competition. Some of that will be manifest in a predominantly maritime context with issues over freedom to use the maritime domain as a key driver, and much of it will have a maritime element. Specifically, there are a rising number of maritime challenges in the South and East China Seas, in the Mediterranean, in the High North, in the Gulf of Guinea, the rise of Asia, a pre predominantly maritime theater, further globalization making the maritime arena more congested and contested, and the rise of new naval powers who will increasingly be the arbiters of events and developments at sea are all part of the picture. What is perhaps less clear is how all that all translates into the continuing utility of conventional naval forces and traditional sea power as currently constituted. And how much does it require us to think anew about what constitutes security at sea, its significance, and how to maintain it? And part of the narrative for what many see as a strategic maritime moment is the toxicity le legacy of the last 10 to 15 years, the aversion to renewed commitments to boots on the ground, and the attraction of a maritime-enabled engagement or influence without embroilment. But in the aftermath of Libya, and with uncertainty over the level of success and failure in the counter-IS strategy, this is the post-post bit of Iraq and Afghanistan, the doctrinal model for that surely remains a work in progress at best. At what point in this generational struggle, as it's been described, might the strategic imperatives for boots on the ground again assert itself, and what, what does that say about the maritime moment? And there are any number of structural issues with which today's navies must contend. One is this, the length of time it currently takes to develop and procure ships and capability, and particularly in an age of continuing austerity, governments will need reassurance that the level of investment and sustained commitment required to procure such ships and capabilities will produce the expected strategic and security return. Half of today's major warships will still be in the world's naval fleets in 2030. It takes about three decades to renew a major Navy's order of battle. Will that be sustainable in the new geostrategic seascape? If it has to be, changes require early decision and action. And as I've suggested, we may be at an inflection point of change in the maritime sphere that will require new and agile thinking. Here is a particular and perhaps familiar example, the first of the UK's new generation of large aircraft carriers, HMS Queen Elizabeth. To the Royal Navy, the fact that successive governments have persisted with this controversial program is a symbol of a continuing 
commitment to national strategic ambition. But this is already a 20-year project. The early studies on possible replacements for the previous invincible class like carriers began in the 1990s, and this ship has a planned service life of 50 years. Assuming that that comes to pass, her final commanding officer probably has not yet been born. The parents of the last young sailors to serve aboard her may not yet have been born. There could be young crew members aboard for her decommissioning ceremony in, say, the late 2060s, who would be the great-great-grandchildren of the senior officers who oversaw those early ship studies in the 1990s. When this ship was conceived, it was as the result of a deliberate strategic decision, not simply to repeat the scale and capability of the Invincible class, but to go for something that provided a step change back up the ladder of power projection capability. That has looked increasingly questionable as costs have risen and the rest of the fleet has shrunk. But the strategic current may be shifting again. Maybe over the life of this ship, scale and the flexibility that that brings will be its main strategic assets. The ultimate luxury is space. And its utility will not chiefly be in a national but a full integrated alliance context. Still, quite apart from the question of what type of aircraft she might be operating at the end of her working days, what kind of software and systems will she need to function and be effective? Of course, design concepts like modularity can help, but what kind of role will she have in what kind of battle fleet in the future relative to what other kinds of naval vessels? Now, here's another Queen Elizabeth. This is RMS Queen Elizabeth and a cautionary tale in assessing the durability of apparent trends, and also a personal tale. Part of the reason I'm interested in all of these sorts of things uh, is because of a childhood treat back in 1968 when, uh, as a seven-year-old, I was in a small tour boat chugging around Southampton, and I gazed up at this rather extraordinary ship with uh, awestruck amazement. Um, even though she was a bit rusty, Cunard had just sold her and therefore had given up um, uh, painting her. It still seemed like a, an extraordinary um, symbol of, a, of, of, of naval and maritime prestige. And at 80,000 tons, she'd already held the title of the world's largest passenger ship ever built for nearly three decades. And she looked set to retain it in perpetuity because the received wisdom at the time, the established wisdom, was that flying had doomed the passenger liner as a means of transport and cruising was just a quaint twilight industry. This is the current largest passenger ship in the world, the allure of the sea. Queen Elizabeth, 83,000 gross tons. Allure of the sea, 225,000 gross tons. She is one of at least 60 cruise liners operating now that are bigger than the old Queen Elizabeth. And there are at least two dozen others that are on the stocks. Indeed, we've been witnessing the greatest ever era of passenger ship construction. Total cruise liner capacity now numbers nearly half a million passenger berths. Total numbers of passengers carried in 2014 numbered more than 22 million, 17 million of them from, the, from North America and Europe. What safety and security liability does that represent? And it may be, and this underscores it, it may be that we are just at the beginning of the odyssey of using the oceans as an arena for human pastime, and of course, much more generally, of human activity. Indeed, we've just passed through the greatest cycle of overall shipbuilding in history. These ships aren't quite dwarfed by the monster new container ships of the world shipping lines, but they're certainly overshadowed by them. They are all dwarfed by this, the Prelude, the world's largest vessel, 600,000 deadweight tons, certainly the first floating liquefied natural gas plant and the largest offshore passenger facility, uh, um, largest offshore facility ever built. These are all physical embodiments of the transformational nature of the maritime domain and how it has itself transformed and mushroomed on the back of trade growth well in advance of global economic growth. Anyway, after the period of Iraq and Afghanistan, the mantra of the maritime domain's global significance has become more familiar of late. There's been less talk in maritime and naval circles of sea blindness. The mantra includes the physical superhighway of globalization. 90% of world trade by volume travels by sea in more than 100,000 ships. 
world trade has quadrupled in the last four decades and is set to double again by 2030. These are figures from the Global Marine Trends 2030 survey report by Lloyd's Register, Kinetic and Strathclyde University. This also underscores a trend of growing urbanization and littoralization of a world population which could grow from 6.9 billion in 2010 to 8 billion in 2030, a world in which nine of the 10 top dozen global megacities are ports. The number of floating oil and gas platforms could go up from 270 in 2010 to more than 600 by 2030, the number of offshore wind turbines from just over 800 to more than 90,000 in the same time frame. There has, of course, been the discontinuity of the 2008 economic crisis, followed by a fragile recovery in the developed world and the difficulties in the large emerging economies that have not provided the motor for further global growth that had been forecast. Still, in spite of my cautionary tale about anticipated trends, the anticipation is of a maritime industry recovery that will see the shipping routes become more crowded than ever. There is a huge demand for new investment in maritime industry infrastructure, including megaport facilities. That in itself sets its own set of security issues. And there's the potential for new patterns of trade with expanding consumer demand in Asia and perhaps also at last in Africa. How will that affect who has what stake in the maritime future? Overall, this is a domain that is becoming more congested and contested across a spectrum of acti activities. The maritime is also a domain in, in which, as in so many other geostrategic areas, not surprisingly, the center of gravity is shifting eastwards. And it is in the Asia-Pacific region where, for the moment, there are, appears to be the most volatile mix of increased competition and resources, neighborhood frictions, and increasing struggles for influence. But in the mix of dynamic change, the Indian Ocean, too, is perceived increasingly as a strategic hub with its sea lanes set only to grow in significance as the funnels of trade between East Asia and Europe and increasingly also Africa around the Cape of Good Hope and into the South Atlantic and to South America. In this increasingly congested and contested environment, where do responsibility and risk lay now? How much will it be back to the future for navies? carrying out a 19th century sounding task of protecting the sea routes. Against what level of threat when they are so diminished in terms of numbers and presence and amongst the major powers have other priorities? The threat of piracy of Somalia offered perhaps a limited model of naval, government and industry and international judicial coming together. But the New York Times has only just in the last few days highlighted the scale of some of the challenges to illegality at sea, the challenges to legality at sea, with the compounding issues of contested waters, rising stakes, and the opening up of new routes thanks to climate change and a mel melting Arctic. What chance government-driven change in a more competitive geopolitical environment when the fabric of such maritime law as exists might itself become increasingly contested? One clear indicator of the dramatic change in the maritime scene has been the proliferation of new maritime strategies. We've heard about a couple of them. The United States has just published its second in less than a decade. But NATO, the European Union, and the United Kingdom have also recently unveiled new str strategic documents. And China's recent new military strategy document proclaimed a new level of maritime ambition that one could argue sees the People's Liberation Army Navy promoted to the position of senior service, moving from a focus on what is dubbed offshore waters defense to what it describes as open seas protection. Still, the most significant of these documents is the new US maritime strategy published in March. Ostensibly, it is just a reworking of the previous 2007 document and even carries the same title, a cooperative strategy for 21st century sea power. But it is a very different beast and a bellwether of a changed mindset, heralding an unmistakable refocusing on high-end naval capabilities with inevitable ripple effects for allies, partners, and potential adversaries. The former document, the 2007 strategy, came at a time of continued engagement in the two long land campaigns. It was a relatively low-key reminder of the strategic insurance policy value of maritime power with an accent on cooperation and a focus on new maritime security missions, including humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. 
There is still talk of partnership and cooperation in the new one, but against a very different set of strategic uh, imperatives. The real watchwords this time are all domain access, war fighting, and forward presence. The tone is competitive more than cooperative. The main driver is China. The main concern is that developments in anti-access area denial technologies like adva advanced anti-ship ballistic and cruise missiles have progressed more quickly and more significantly than had previously been expected. Uh, this graphic is uh, from the latest edition of the Institute's military balance. It portrays what the Obama administration's rebalance to Asia looks like in terms of deployed U.S. warships uh, up to 2020. In some ways, it doesn't look that dramatic in terms of change, but it is. And the significance also lies in what's behind this in terms of the fact that this arena is where Washington's most advanced naval technology is being deployed first, like, for example, the carrier-borne version of the F-35 strike fighter, joint strike fighter. And the relationship between these two gentlemen, or rather people who will after them also hold their offices, the current uh, US Chief of Naval Operations and his Chinese counterpart, will remain a complex one, as will that between the two nations overall. There's been much debate of late about hybrid warfare, Geopolitical relationships are also becoming more hybrid, at once cooperative and competitive. The US maritime strategy speaks of China's naval expansion presenting both challenges and opportunities. This is one perspective on the challenge. Two images, last year and early this, of one of the contested reefs on which China has been carrying out land reclamation, which has attracted so much attention and provoked so much speculation as to what fundamentally it implies. The opportunities, of course, lie in such activities as China's cooperation on the counter-piracy mission in the Gulf of Aden. The balance that unfolds between these two elements of the same relationship is, of course, the key. But on the face of it, the new US maritime strategy is assertive and confident. Reading between the lines, though, and particularly given the budgetary climate, there's a sense of unease about how the United States can sustain its naval ascendancy with obvious strategic implications. A fear that naval power projection could be overwhelmed by the new reach and weight of precise firepower that can be projected against it, chiefly from the land. Is this what could tip the balance and be the answer in the future? This laser test bed has been at sea in the Gulf. The US Navy's hope is that its future big brothers could be the answer to the ballistic and cruise missile threats and the volume of fire potentially that could be ranged against naval formations in the future. And more broadly, that emerging technology can keep the balance between sea control and sea denial. But how mature are these technologies really and how quickly can they be brought into operation? Also, what does all this mean for Washington's allies in NATO the publication of a new alliance maritime strategy was meant to provide a bedrock for NATO's re-emergence from the land-centric focus of Afghanistan. The interventions of Russia and President Vladimir Putin have appeared to have blown these ambitions off course. The focus of concerns and response appear once again to be land-centric. But here too, the maritime dimension is potentially significant. There's been much attention lately on the Russian bomber and combat aircraft sorties probing NATO preparedness. Um, but of course, uh, in the new strategic climate, naval deployments are receiving increased attention too. And largely unseen, Russian submarine activity is at its highest level since the 1990s. The new Russian challenge is affecting the Alliance's maritime flanks in the Baltic Sea, and even more so, the Black Sea, and thus, affecting the naval and maritime balance in that most strategic but unstable of sea areas for the alliance, the Eastern Mediterranean. After years when much of European NATO has been focused on the lower end missions of maritime security and monitoring, has the high end challenge of anti-access area denial suddenly reemerged not just in the Pacific and in the Persian Gulf in connection with Iran, but also for the alliance? <coughs> How does that affect the calculus of NATO reassurance, deterrence, and crisis management? Has the maritime aspect of all that received enough attention? The 
perception is that it remains the weakest link of the alliance response to the new strategic dynamic in Europe. The paradox is that in a global context, European NATO retains a significant pool of major warship categories, aviation capable and amphibious ships, high capability air defense destroyers and deployable ocean patrol frigates, translating that into a more cohesive and credible alliance capability on a sustained basis has been where things have fallen down, not least in terms simply of operational readiness. And then there is the vision thing for the future of European maritime capabilities. For some, like the Royal Navy, the return to geostrategic comp competition and the proliferation of anti-access area denial capabilities have also decisively reaffirmed, if you like, its focus of interest back from maritime security to high-end warfighting capability and a global outlook. Hence the recent publication of the joint US-UK vision of combined sea power. But for others, the migrant, crisis is a the migrant crisis is a reminder of the maritime security challenges closer to home in the context of the Islamic State threat as the security priority. At the Institute's recent Shangri-La dialogue in Singapore, the presence and the remarks of the British and German defense ministers and the EU foreign policy chief underlined the stake that Europe has in the Asia-Pacific region. But key and unanswered questions are whether and how Europe might be an active player, especially in the maritime domain. It's a strategic choice over which European nations have yet really to send a clear signal. And part of the question is what does it mean to be a continued valued strategic ally to the United States? Does it just mean filling in the gaps in one's own backyard, or more than that, being prepared to engage where Washington's priorities are focused as well? Of course, for Europe in the spectrum of possible naval tasking and horizons of ambition, potentially there is something for everyone, if only, again, credible collaboration, interoperability, and role specialization can be achieved and also a sensible division of labor between NATO and the European Union. And however much NATO and Europe decide to go out into the world and operate and be present in other people's maritime backyards, the world, whether it's the Chinese, <coughs> Indian, or Iranian navies, is coming into its strategic backyard with consequences that, again, could be complex. So where does this all take us in terms of some of the sea change challenges? First, the need for a more profound debate over the character and security uh, and warfighting uh, issues around the maritime domain. As has been said, there hasn't been a conflict at sea in a general sense since the Second World War, nor has the maritime domain enjoyed, if that's the right word, the imperative that urgent operational requirements in Iraq and Afghanistan have produced in the land and air environments to gain rapid development of key enabling capabilities. There's a lot of technical and conceptual catch-up to be done. There has, as I've said, been much debate about the re-emergence of hybrid warfare, what's really novel about it, and therefore what challenge it represents. It may not be novel conceptually, but in terms of tactics, techniques, and technology, it does pose issues in terms of response and deterrence. And it has a maritime dimension. What's unfolded recently in the South China Sea, an incremental approach, call it tailored coercion, gray zones, the use of paramilitary and non-military levers like coast guards and even fishing fleets to exert pressure and establish new norms on the sea, throws up similar challenges. Potentially, one could argue, there is the prospect of a revolution in naval affairs. Of course, we're some four decades now into the era of precision anti-ship missiles, and from the outset of that period, the question has been raised again and again as to whether big ships are inevitably doomed. In the absence, apart, of course, from the Falklands of a major naval battle in this era, we are, in effect, all nothing more than theorists. But the challenge, particularly to surface fleets now from the proliferation of anti-access area denial capabilities, including possibly their dis dissemination to non-state actors, does seem to be of a new order. Are emerging technologies the realistic answer to that, as is the US Navy's clear aspiration? If so, what are the implications for the US Navy and its interoperability with allies, even the most capable like the Royal Navy? Can they stay with the US Navy if it's steaming full speed in the emerging technology direction? 
And where does that leave the US Navy when it says it needs partnerships and integration to fulfill its missions globally? There is also the potential for major transformation in the underwater domain, again with potentially profound consequences. That is linked to the further development of unmanned systems in the maritime context. Some of the practitioners in the submarine and mine warfare fields are skeptical about whether these technologies will be quite as transformational as some predict. Data transmission rates underwater remain a major hurdle, for example. The leap, if it's to be really transformational, transformational may need to be properly autonomous systems, with all that that implies in terms of grappling with concepts and ethics. And how much transparency of the oceans does there need to be to make a game-changing difference at sea? The closing technological gap between the established naval powers and the emerging ones will likely mean the need to revisit the eternal debate over quality versus numbers of ships. Has the trade-off now reached its limit? And as Asian, uh, Asia's new maritime powers rise, perhaps with very tailored missions in their regions, will they provide new models of how navies look and are designed? Who will be the drivers of this? Just the United States or China? European nations surely have a part to play in developing the counter technologies to anti-access area denial capabilities. We are probably only at the beginning in another technological context. We are probably only at the beginning of understanding the implications of cyber warfare in a naval context. Is it simply a major potential threat to the net network capabilities that are at the heart of the major navies' operational capabilities now, or are warships ideal platforms for prosecuting cyber campaigns? So, the major geostrategic developments recently, the fallout with Russia over Crimea and eastern Ukraine and events in East Asia, have not only helped refocus attention on the maritime domain, they are forcing navies to look again at their capabilities, commitments, and readiness. From the top down, in other words, the US Navy has forced, this has forced major navies to refocus on their high-end warfighting capabilities after years of concentrating more on the lower end of the spectrum. But that is in some cases throwing up new issues over technological change, conceptually, and over training and skills. And while this doesn't mean even the major fleets are turning their back on the maritime security missions, it does also suggest that there will be a growing gap to be filled there, somehow, on the broader range of enforcement and other monitoring tasks to sustain an environment generally of good order at sea. Thank you. Nick, thank you very much for uh, packing so much into your uh, 28 uh, or so minutes. Um, I think there's a lot uh, of, of uh, uh, food for thought there, and I'm sure um, our guests will want to engage you on uh, a number of the themes uh, you have raised. If you'd like to do so, please do catch my eye. Uh, we do have a roving microphone, um, and uh, straight away we have the first question over there. Please, sir. If you could, if you could uh, briefly introduce yourself, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, the name's Ewan Grant, um, former government intelligence analyst, though I must stress in law enforcement, not defense or foreign policy. Um, I'd just like to, I thought you made so many key points, particularly about um, Area, uh, regional denial and also the relationship between the US and its European allies and that's particularly um, my question um, do you f how would you see the European role alongside the United States is it providing niche capabilities to supplement the US or is it also um, to provide duplication and reserve capacity. I've worked in European Commission law enforcement projects, including in Yemen, where I heard a word mentioned at the next table in the hotel and realized, got talking to the people, and they realized they were former SEALs, just from one word. They mentioned the word Makrahanish, and so drew my own conclusions. Um, I've got grave concerns about the European civilian will to look at geopolitical and strategic issues. European civilian will, I do stress that. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I think it, potentially it covers a, a range of um, options, depending, if you like, on uh, where you go in Europe. Uh, if you talk about European maritime capabilities, uh, you know, there are three words, all of which can be interpreted, interpreted in terms of definition and ambition, depending on um, which part of Europe you're talking about. Uh, the key, I think, is whether um, cohesively they can be brought together in a, a way that increases uh, overall effectiveness uh, uh, in capabilities that are greater than the sum of their parts, uh, and that includes not only ownership of capabilities but also willingness to um, train and operate them effectively and to turn up when required. And then uh, it will be a case to some extent of, as I said, there is something for everybody potentially. At the highest level, um, one is talking not about niche capabilities, but su significant strategic capabilities that can play an integrated part in the global partnership that the U US Navy under um, particularly the current CNO is trying to uh, create around the world. And, and, and you have, for example, the um, uh, US-UK combined sea power vision, where ultimately, clearly, the uh, United Kingdom and, the, and particularly driven by the Royal Navy sees a carrier strike capability as part of the operational deployment mix of uh, the US Navy globally uh, such that for example a, a UK carrier could fit um, uh, into the Gulf when there is a gap there in US Navy capability. So at a strategic level there is um, uh, potential integration uh, and uh, filling in uh, in, uh, in key capabilities at a lower level, there are niche capabilities that European countries can provide um, if they have a willingness to do so, um, where the United States uh, does not. Maritime countermeasures is, is one. And again, the UK in, 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 in the Gulf is providing a strategic uh, uh, capability there. The level of ambition is a key one, uh, and, uh, and it, it is to do to some extent with you know, global outlook. Um, but actually, in the maritime domain, potentially some of the political obstacles and the political hurdles that can exist in other areas of, um, of collaboration may be uh, less of an issue. Um, that we've already uh, had uh, you know, German air defense destroyers filling in gaps in uh, carrier strike uh, groups in the U, uh, uh, US Navy the way that the British and, uh, and the Dutch and others have as well. So uh, it's a range of potential um, uh, areas, um, all of which depend really on uh, who, wants to, who has what capability and how far they want to go with it. Nick, before, before I call on the next uh, 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 person to, to ask, ask a question, can I just ask you to, to expand on, on a particular aspect of this um, because it fits with, with uh, what has just been asked. You mentioned the discussions at the Shangri-La Dialogue uh, at the end of May, early June, um, and uh, you mentioned the statements that were made by uh, uh, European ministers, uh, by the EU high representative, what, you know, is there a role for Europe in the maritime domain in that particular region, South and East China Seas? Is, do you see a role there, and, and what would that look like? Uh, potentially there is one. I think potentially there are European players who are looking at, at that and how to engage. Um, uh, not wishing to um, prejudge the... Uh, SDSR that's uh, unfolding now, um, but on the agenda, I think, is, is how global the ambition is going to be for the UK uh, and how deliverable it will be. So in terms of the, you know, the global players, the usual suspects, if you like, um, I think potentially, I'm talking about the, the UK, about France, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and 
France, you can argue, is a Pacific is a is a Pacific player anyway. Um, they have you know they have ambition and, and and they potentially have a role to play. But the the, the, the one of the key questions uh, is how that how how to engage. And one of the key differences uh, in terms of uh, the geostrategic landscape in Europe compared to Asia is the the lack necessarily of a of a of a platform with which to engage. NATO is the obvious one in, in security terms in Europe, but what is it in, um, in the uh, Asia-Pacific region that one would engage with? Because how uh, countries like uh, the UK and France and, and, and potentially others, Europe, might, might wish to engage will have an impact on how that seascape unfolds. Uh, one can do it in the context of friendly, friendly nations. Uh, the, the UK has the five power defense arrangement. Uh, one can do it in the context of you know, strategic alliances with, on a bilateral basis with, with Japan, say, and, and ultimately with the United States. Um, but where does that take uh, that engagement in terms of whatever the ultimate uh, strategic goal may be, which presumably is, uh, you know, is a, a stability um, construct and less cho choppy waters than we have now. Mm. Thank you. So, question, uh, second row there in the back. Yes. Uh, Eric Grove. Um, thank you, Nick, for a wonderful presentation. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with it, really. Um, but just to underline it, we must realize that we cannot depend on the Americans any more. I've, I've, I subscribe as well as to the IISS to Stratfor. And every two weeks we have, where is the US fleet? And the answer is not, not actually very much. Over the last year or two, there has been one aircraft carrier operation. One, a whole one. They may have 10 or 11, but only one has been actually there. It's usually in the fifth fleet. They're, they're quite sensible when they send their carrier out. They visit places like Portsmouth and so on, like Theodore Roosevelt did. And then when they're going home, they bring George Washington out from Yokosuka, and they do something against, against the Chinese. But the American Navy is no longer the great supplier of naval power anymore. And it comes back to what we've been talking about, about the Europeans. And I think, Nick, you, you, you yourself have written about this, haven't you? That in fact, the aircraft carrier, which may be looking after, Europe, looking after Western interests in the early 2020s, might actually be flying the White Ensign. Now, it may be carrying American aircraft, but it's very interesting, the current plans for a combined air group of, say, two, two U.S. Marine squadrons and one RAF slash fleet air arm squadron. But the Europeans have to do more. <coughs> Actually, the situation isn't that bad. If you look at the European navies, you've got the Conte di Cavour for the Italians, you've got the, uh, uh, you've got the Juan Carlos in, in Spain, you've got the amphibious ships in the Netherlands, and so on. The Europeans have, in fact, got together quite a powerful force of navies. And they are going to have to, I think, in the future, fill the gaps that the Americans won't be able to. Sequestration has been a disaster for the US Navy. People not being trained, no pilots being trained. The US Navy, I want to go as far as saying it's a shell, but actually it isn't as powerful as it seems. And now we Europeans have got to do more. Now, actually, we're able to do that, thanks to the carrier program, thanks to the various European naval programs. And I think the emphasis needs to be on this watery planet. As I often say, you've probably heard me say this before, <laughs> that when you look at this planet from space, it's not Earth, it's Oceania. It's blue. It's covered by, by water. And I think what we might be seeing, and I, as I say, I agree entirely with what you said, is that... The Europeans are beginning, after all, the Charles de Gaulle is going to be the carrier in the Gulf area quite soon. Because I don't think if, I don't, I'm not sure if the Americans can actually deploy one there anymore. So the Charles de Gaulle will be filling the gap. And Queen Elizabeth will be filling the gap in a few years' time. And the Europeans are going to have to do more. And we're going into, I think, the 2020s, I think, is going to be the era when the European navies are going to exert themselves again in cooperation with the Americans, of course. But if the Americans really are turning to Asia and they're really turning towards China and anti-access area denial and all that stuff, it's going to be a major concern for them. And they will expect 
and we ought to be doing it ourselves, that we Europeans, with our naval traditions, our naval forces, will actually be the people who will fill the gaps in a newly balanced Western maritime position. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. I think you, you might want to you might want to put this in a in a in the bigger context of how much U.S. the U.S. Navy's preeminence is under threat, and what that might mean with regards to expectations uh, to Europe, but also others. Yes, and uh, 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 thank you, Eric, for your comments. Uh, and uh, uh, absolutely, in in, in terms of the. Uh, at least the perceived and actual overstretch that one is seeing in in U.S. Navy um, deployments even now, they you know they are wearing out and and they are running hot uh, to coin a phrase uh, because you know there's been there's been any amount of debate over um, the you know the extent to which the U.S. Navy's supremacy is is under threat and people talk of oh the, you know the, the the royal navy had a two power standard uh, the the us navy if you if you count um, ship tonnage has a 13 power standard i e you know it's bigger than the next 13 uh, navies uh, uh, put together and most of those are allies um, uh, but it's all to do with what navies are for and the, the us navy is the one with the with the the global responsibilities, and uh, for that reason, uh, it, it, you know, it, it might look as if it's um, uh, absolutely replete in capabilities, but they are stretched very thin. Um, you you can argue that you know there 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 are other ways of approaching, you know, the future in terms of responsibilities other than you know 306 ships, which is the head you know the head mark. For uh, for the U.S. Navy, can they could they look at a new cr construct? Can they look at other ways? They are looking at other ways of spreading their maritime uh, capability. The, the distributed lethality concept of of uh, distributing uh, offensive capability um, around the fleet uh, is, is a promising way forward. Um, the the question uh, in terms of uh, not only uh, you know, U.S. Navy obligations and responsibilities, but how gaps could be filled uh, is, is something I, I, I tried to allude to in, in, in the talk. And, and yes, at the high end level of you know, strategic assets like carriers, amphibious ships, um, air defense destroyers, there is, a, there, is a, um, there is a stock there. It's making the most of uh, putting those all together in a credible way that the United States uh, in its strategic um, calculations uh, would look at as credible. I mean, there, there is, I mean, is it, I'm not sure if it's well known, but there is actually a European carrier strike group uh, that meets to look at um, the, uh, the ways of deployments of, of Europe's carrier capabilities in the future. The ironic thing at the, at the moment, or until, um, until recently, was actually the chair of it was the U UK, when um, we don't actually have a carrier at the moment. But, um, but uh, I think that is more uh, because of uh, an acknowledgement of of intent. Um, the, the only other thing I would say is that that doesn't necessarily mean that in terms of Europe's desire to see um, the United States remain engaged in the European theater, that that shouldn't and probably must involve a long-term commitment of naval capability. And, and ironically, and in my previous incarnation as a journalist, I was out in, um, in Rota uh, last year to see the uh, arrival of the first um, um, of a new uh, forward-deployed set of ballistic missile defense destroyers. Um, they were brought in initially. The messaging initially was that this was part of a ballistic missile defense uh, capability to uh, provide credibility to population defense of the, the NATO area, but by the time the ships had arrived, the whole pivot to Asia was uh, underway, and um, the messaging had changed from this, these ships are about ballistic missile de defense to these are multi-purpose ships, um, and you know part of our continuing commitment to Europe. And ironically, the ship I was on, the Donald Cook, was the one that then immediately went off to the Black Sea and got buzzed by the Russians. So that was its first taste of the European theater. But the problem in terms of uh, US 
Navy as the bellwether for US commitment in Europe is that, as all maritime proponents will say, the problem, the virtue and the problem with ships is you can put them in, but you can move them as well. So what they represent in terms of uh, reassurance of uh, the United States in Europe is questionable. Thank you, Nick. I've got four people on my list now, I just five now. Um, so uh, the first one on the list is uh, Sir Michael. Uh, yes. Uh, Michael Arthur, former diplomat. I've uh, taken halfway to where I want to take you further. Uh, you talked about China, very interesting. And you gave us a rather dramatic picture of the pace of change of the island from the reef to the island. And we all know that the pace of change in terms of massive production is there. You also spoke about the widening technological gulf between the US, even its allies, which we all know is true. Can you say something about the pace of technological change on the Chinese capacity and how that relates to the pace of change in the American capacity? So is that gap widening or narrowing? Lots of Chinese ships, how technologically sophisticated will they be? Uh, there is movement, um, clearly, in terms of um, both technological uh, capability and mass as far as China is concerned. There's, a, there, there's been a huge amount of focus on um, the Chinese aircraft carrier uh, as a statement of its ultimate um, naval ambition. Uh, that actually, for some time to come, will not be uh, a key, key strategic asset. In fact, it will, if anything, be something of a liability should, should uh, you know, um, hot confrontation um, uh, unfold in the near future, where uh, the uh, significance, at least in the short to medium term, is of, na of um, Chinese uh, naval and technological developments are in areas like submarines, where admittedly from a long way behind they are making progress, but fundamentally in their ability from the land with missile capabilities to um, put at risk uh, US forward deployed naval forces. There's been much debate about whether uh, the, 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 the real effectiveness of the ballistic missile anti-ship ballistic missile capability that, um, that has been much trumpeted. Uh, but uh, it, it's certainly giving the United States pause and the anti-ship cruise missile capability both uh, from ashore, from aircraft, and from submarines are where uh, you know, the focus of concern is for the Americans at the moment. Uh, and and uh, I think it is a genuine uh, concern, uh, the issue for them will, is how in the long term uh, you can open the gap again in terms of countering that as a way of operating in the domain as the United States has in the past and intends to in the future. Thank you. There was a gentleman here in the, yeah, the aisle in the, in the middle, yes. George Hyatt, I'm a law student at City University London. Remaining on the China question, with China not refusing to recognize the jurisdiction of the Permanent Court of Arbitration and not even sending lawyers to the Philippines' recent case against the 9 dash line, and indeed pushing that line, pushing maritime borders right back to the 12 mile limit and ignoring EEZs in many cases. Is the internationalist era of the law of the sea coming to an end, and are we reverting purely to the question of what I have, I hold? vice versa, or is there a future position or a future hope for continuing internationalist legal solutions to maritime disputes? I think this is all very much the test case in, in, in general terms, and it is the cockpit on which this is all going to be, um, is all going to be uh, uh, judged and how, how um, ultimately will it, it will unfold. Um, and the problem at the moment uh, is, I mentioned you know, the, 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 hy the hybrid issue in the context of Europe, Russia, and, and, and Eastern Ukraine. It is also in very much in the context of what is going on in, in uh, the South and East China Seas, is that at the moment there seems to be no model for affecting, uh, affecting a change of behavior, uh, whichever avenue is, is pursued. Um, 
and, and that is the challenge going forward. Uh, if the hope is, and it must be the hope, that it, that it doesn't ultimately lead to you know, the hot, hot confrontation. Um, uh, I think uh, as, far as, um, as far as the challenges are concerned, uh, in some ways the rhetoric appears to have died down a little bit, but the concern is that underneath it, underlying it, um, what's happened, what's happening or not happening in the, in the court system, what's not happening uh, in, in terms of uh, a change of um, behavior by China on things like the sands at, uh, at sea, um, is, is that nothing, n nothing is working and uh, the issues seem to be getting more and more entrenched, which, which raises the level of anxiety about at, at what level uh, there will require something more um, stringent in terms of a U.S. and allied response asserting the freedoms that have, um, have, have, been, um, have been assured in the past. Desmond Bourne. Desmond Sorry, Des, can you just hold on for the mic? Yeah, right here. Desmond Byrne, NIS member. Um, Nick, thanks, thanks very much for your talk. Um, I just like to sort of go back to technology, um, and you alluded to this, you showed us a nice picture, I think, of a laser. Um, but I, I'm sort of reminded of the US uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense who talked about um, the need for a third offset, which was um, extremely arcane and confusing way of, I think, talking about new technology and trying to, for the US to kind of um, leap forward into a new era which gave it enormous advantage through its technological expertise and maybe not just technology, also maybe sort of tactics and, and ways in which the military might be used and deployed. And, and, and the sort of, so the question that I have is the extent to which you know, there is evidence that there's something happening, that people are investing money and that people are spending and putting e intellectual investment into responding to this challenge from the Deputy Secretary of Defense. And, and part of that is also the extent to which the Navy is different and separate, or whether this is something where you, know, you can have an idea, whether it's lasers or cyber or some other way of dealing with um, the uh, potential for military conflict whether it's something which is specific to the Navy that has to be developed, or whether it's something generic that you can adapt. There are, it's a combination. Um, one of the areas that I alluded to um, is the further development of unmanned and ultimately autonomous technology. Um, obviously, there are domain-specific uh, challenges to that, but in general terms, as a, way f as a transformational way forward, particularly in terms of the anti-access area denial question, in whatever domain, having that capability um, uh, is, is significant, and there is a lot of effort being put into that. There are particular challenges in the maritime domain. Beyond that, um, There are specifics for the Navy in terms of, for example, dealing with the cruise and ballistic missile threats at sea. Um, there are more generic ones in which, in which, to some extent, the Navy is catching up and plugging in with others. For example, the information domain, um, uh, the, the, the information dominance uh, and the cyber areas. Um, where, as I say, it's not, it's not yet well understood, I think, in general naval terms, but it's being looked at in very um, strongly in, in US naval terms. You know, they are recruiting, um, I think, something like 900 or 1,000 cyber operatives a year at the moment to try and get to grips with this in a naval context. And potentially, um, it is the area of greatest concern to them, but also the area of greatest opportunity because networking is so much part of the asymmetric advantage that the US Navy in particular, but the established navies in general have uh, as far as, uh, as operating and having um, 
advantage over others with greater numbers, um, that it is crucial to them in the future. Thank you. There were two questions in the last row. Uh, the first gentleman, yes, you're on the aisle. And then if you, after you've asked your question, if you could pass the microphone along the row for the next question, uh, okay. I'll, I'll group you into two. My name is Edwin Egede. I'm from Cardiff University. Um, thank you very much, Nick. That was um, a very interesting um, presentation. Um, you, you mentioned at a point during the presentation about the numerous strategies we have, the local, national expressions, and um, regional expressions. And I, I just wanted to ask what your thoughts are in terms of um, do we need more to be done in terms of the global, in terms of a strategy, or do you think um, the national, regional expressions in the in, in US, um, China, um, Europe, and um, you know, basically Africa, do, do you think that's sufficient, or do we need more in terms of the global setting? to help in terms of dealing with maritime security challenges. Thank you. If we could take one, yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Peter Cook from the Security Association for the Maritime Industry. Um, Nick, I've got three questions. The first one is having looked at uh, the UK, US and European Commission, unfortunately haven't looked at the Chinese um, maritime uh, security strategy, but each of their definitions of maritime security are different. Um, I was wondering what you thought was um, the definition of maritime security. Um, I don't know that everybody agrees on it, but it's interesting to hear that. The second one is commercial shipping um, has changed drastically. At the end of the Second World War, more ships were flying the Red Ensign than any other um, flag in the world. That's changed, and the commercial shipping jurisdictional responsibility profile has changed drastically with over 80% of those 100,000 ships that you mentioned belonging to open registries, um, none of which have oceanic fleets. How do we think that's going to affect? Because we won't be able to tell them what to do because they're all commercial entities. And last, by no means least, and you won't be surprised to hear this one, um, private maritime security companies. They have a 100% um, success rate in the um, Indian Ocean. Um, they have possibly paved the way for public-private partnerships within maritime security, what part do you see them playing? Thank you. Thank you very much. Nick. A, a rich menu to pick from. Um, all connected in terms of themes. Uh, and in, in terms of strategies, yes, you're right that um, um, what we have uh, are either regional or national um, stabs at, uh, at strategy. Um, in terms of uh, the, the, the military perspective on the, on the seascape, uh, I think inevitably you're going to have that um, recipe for moving forward and uh, because fundamentally um, uh, what uh, is, is at stake are, are, are national and, and, and regional interests and, and those uh, are specific and, and different in some ways. Um, uh, you know, the striking thing about uh, the maritime scene for decades now has been the United States' uh, role as, as custodians um, of the military maritime scene, but that ultimately is driven first by uh, a national interest um, uh, and a liberal outlook that, 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 that means they carrying out their role across a broader set of um, uh, objectives. Um, however, if one is talking about the maritime security uh, environment more broadly, um, to include safety, the environment, uh, the law of the sea and at sea, I think there you have to have um, some main players who are driving it, but there is where a, a, a global response, reinforcing uh, UNCLOS or whatever, um, is uh, a, a recipe to go forward. Uh, to, to pick up um, um, from Peter, um, 
one of the, as you say, the um, complications, particularly in enforcement of law and regulations, is that the um, profile of you know, beneficial ownership and so on and so forth is getting more and seems to be getting more and more complicated in response to in, in both increased competition and, and congestion at, at, at sea. But the flip side of that is that, in, in my view, the, the stakes that are um, uh, at risk because of what um, freedom at sea and good order at sea means for globalization and the global economy, the shifts in terms of national um, uh, national ownership of um, the maritime stakes, not just military, but commercial in terms of shipbuilding, in terms of, uh, in terms of ownership of shipping, are such that there is a lot, there is potentially, surely, a lobby there um, of uh, groups uh, in, in regions of groups of shipping companies that can, can have a lobbying, an, an effective lobbying role in pushing for you know, global change and global enforcement greater than, than we've had up to now. Um, the question is you know, what the level of risk has to be for people to start um, acting to do that um, and how much of an impact does it have to have on uh, either commercial um, activity or um, global economic prospects uh, for people to act. Maritime security um, firms, private maritime security firms, um, absolutely. I think, although the you know, the Somali piracy thing is a particular um, uh, example, uh, and there, as I hinted, there are complications of uh, pursuing that in an, in in, a, in areas where uh, jurisdictions are contested and, and so on and so forth in an era in which uh, the maritime military challenges are becoming more demanding, um, fleets are even more sparse than they were in dealing with those 100,000 hulls, let alone the, you know, all the fishing, the countless fishing boats that aren't counted in that number, um, are that you know, mar private maritime security must have a role even for example, you know, ultimately, is there a, is there a role for a contracted um, operation to deal with the migration issue at sea? Um, uh, if it is going to be a sustained issue, uh, you know, there are question marks over, you know, over um, what role navies could and should play in that. And you know, um, the Cavour, I think it is, and HMS Bulwark are extremely expensive rescue boats. Um, so, um, so, so in an area like that, yes, I think there is there is uh, scope for a further investigation of the role of, of maritime security at sea as a, a contracted uh, option. Nick, thank you very much. I have uh, three people who are, are still uh, seeking the floor. So, if, Nick, if it's all right, I'll I'll group those together. If that's okay with you. And the first one is uh, Geoffrey van Orden in the second row. Thank you very much, uh, Geoffrey Van Orden. I'm Conservative Defence Spokesman in the European Parliament. Um, first of all, a comment, um, a cautionary word, really, to everybody. Don't, don't let us confuse uh, European and European Union. Uh, I think the European Union has ambitions uh, to create roles for itself. These aren't necessarily appropriate. Um, it is certainly the case that European uh, nations need to contribute more, as you've uh, well described. There are many permutations of ways in which they might do that. Um, first and foremost, of course, uh, 22 of them are NATO uh, member states, uh, but there are other permutations as well, um, which really brings me to my question. And I wonder, um, some would say that, of course, it's not appropriate for NATO to be operating, let's say, in Asian waters, uh, although that's debated. Um, do you foresee a need for uh, new alliances. And the one country that hasn't been mentioned so far, of course, is India. And how do you foresee, in the context perhaps, of new alliances, how do you see the Indian role? Thank you very much. 
Um, here in the first row, the lady in the first row. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel Hilton. Just picking up on the legal questions, um, the New York Times pieces to which you referred laid out a very uh, bleak picture, I suppose, of ungoverned spaces in all, uh, in w which are in terms of civil law, environmental law, criminal law, um, a massive vacuum. I just wondered whether, to what degree you think these concerns would be incorporated as a more conventional security concern. And in the, just to pursue the point of building a legal regime, how, how much would it help if the United States were to ratify UNCLOS? Thank you very much. And in the second row, the, yes, let's take one more. Hello, Bob Tarrant, Naval Officer and Practitioner. Nick, thanks for a great tour to Horizon. I haven't heard it put across so clearly with all the challenges we'd have. So if I may, I can just offer a couple of comments rather than questions. The first one is um, you can get seduced into just looking at the world through where the Americans are pitching themselves. The key issue from a practitioner's point of view is that each of these areas that you've mentioned, if you do a threat reduction, requires a different set of capabilities and a different priority in those capabilities to be dealt with. Uh, so you've got to play a, a lot more subtly than, than it, it appears if you're just looking at a top-down approach. The second part is that uh, fear that you wish to create in your enemy's eyes from fleets such as put requires actually more than equipment and hulls. It requires training and particularly it requires aggressive command and control. The real message I'd have for this audience where command and control is concerned is particularly with the onset of this new technology being brought in quite quickly, um, that the doctrines and ideas behind uh, a, a much wider margin of the very advanced US and our very reliable but slightly older generational colleagues, for example in ASW where you're bringing European people together, uh, that is a complex trick to pull when you're now going to look at traditional frigates versus air balloons and what have you, and ROVs, these are difficult things and they need practicing. So this isn't something that you can play with and say on the day it's going to work. You need to be really working at a threat reduction in each of these areas and keeping your training up very specifically to deal with those issues. I'll only make one comment, if I may, on a, a broader issue. It's easier for us through NATO and our European allies uh, to work very closely with the US because we have normative behavior. We have understandings of how people are going to respond and what they're going to do. When you get to the Far East, of course, what was actually being looked at at the moment is sea control, not the view of territory. That is the problem of those people in that area. The question is, when does sea control start being challenged by the changes in some of the island sets or not? And you're probably quite a long way from that. But what you have to do, therefore, is, as I said, really do a classic threat reduction piece and say, we're going to do that very, very well indeed, and we're going to command it aggressively and competently. Those are the things that I would say uh, we need to be ensuring. Um, and of course, the Royal Navy does have an immensely close relationship with the United States Navy, and we're very proud of that, and it's working its way right to the heart of all our capabilities and our thinking. Thanks. Thank you very much. Nick, uh, the question on new alliances, mm. particularly the role of India, mm. the question on ungoverned spaces, uh, and of course, any comments you would like to make on the comments, um, or uh, any, any response you'd like to give is obviously also very welcome. Mm. Um, sort of meander through, not, not, not in the order in which they were um, um, uh, asked or offered, but um, uh, as, as uh, I think is logical. And I'll start with um, the issue of um, uh, the ungoverned spaces. Um, for all that uh, the UN, the, the United States uh, sticks by um, the provisions of UNCLOS, I think it would be a huge step if it were actually uh, uh, formally to ratify it uh, and, and become party to it. Um, and 
I think that could be an energizing um, uh, w way uh, for the United States to um, push for uh, greater enforcement. Uh, and there is potentially a security element to uh, dealing with this, which again, the United States from its standpoint uh, could have a greater role in pursuing not in terms of military, uh, as, in, as in United States Navy um, involvement, but in terms of the forward uh, use of things like the US Coast Guard, in terms of them, uh, uh, as they do in, or, or already to some extent, uh, in terms of using vehicles like that to build local capacity. I think that is a way, definitely, of going forward. Um, in terms of new alliances, certainly uh, new relationships, as I, as, as, as I hinted. Um, the new seascape is going to have as its main influences different actors in the future. And absolutely, uh, it may not quite be keeping up with its own ambitions at the moment, but India, uh, in the longer term, has a, a, a very significant role to play you know, as, as potentially leaders in a hub area to which um, traditional um, navies like European navies could add their capabilities in the way that, you know, the Indians added capabilities to uh, European and Royal Navy task forces in the past. So I think the role of new relationships with uh, new arbiters like India um, uh, absolutely a, w a, a way forward. Um, the, the issue of uh, Washington's partners in all of this in the future, and clearly they are the, the U.S. Navy from, I think it was Admiral Mike Mullen, you know, originally sort of had the concept of a thousand ship Navy. Um, uh, this has been turned into the global network of navies as a way at a certain level of engaging at a certain level of concern. Um, uh, absolutely, uh, there is a network there. I was at the um, uh, event last week when um, the CNO and First Sea Lord publicly uh, spoke, I think, for the first time together about this new joint vision. I, to some extent, have been a skeptic in the sense that how can, how, how much value and how special and how unique is the relationship between the US and the UK, for example, uh, even with their traditions, um, relative to, say, uh, the US and Japan. You know, and, and, uh, we have 19 frigates and destroyers, albeit and a couple of aircraft carriers on the way. They have twice as many destroyers and frigates as, as we do in a critical part of the world. Uh, and they have, you know, critical, um, potentially strategic engagements with the US Navy, like in ballistic missile defense, which we don't have. Uh, and CNO preempted me in, in saying, uh, whatever, whatever the other um, um, perspectives on our relationships, the one that is really different is ours with um, the UK. To the level of trust and operational trust, uh, you know, is such that, and I know it's become a controversial issue, that, you know, only UK pilots uh, fly combat missions in the uh, cockpits of US Navy F-18s. It is only to uh, the UK perisher course that um, the United States sends its potential submarine commanders. And that is a level of um, a level of engagement that, are, that that isn't unmatched, albeit that you can be sceptical about just how much strategic impact at the moment the UK Royal Navy can bring to whatever conundrums the US Navy is grappling with at the moment, at the scale that the UK is in terms of fleet size at the moment. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, um, thank you very much for this for this discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for for contributing and for making uh, Nick, uh, what I think is your inaugural outing as a, a, a senior fellow here in a discussion meeting, uh, 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 such a, 
a, a lively session. Um, thank you very much for that. And Nick, thank you in particular, of course, for uh, not just scanning these new maritime horizons, but uh, providing us with a very comprehensive and coherent uh, assessment of the key trends uh, as you see them in the maritime domain. Uh, I think a uh, very rich presentation, lots of food for thought. Thank you very much for that. Thank you all for coming. And uh, let's thank Nick in the, in the usual way. Thank you very much. <laughs>